Welcome to our second session on Puerto Rico Way Ahead. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Major General John Wharton, U.S. Army retired. General Wharton has had a distinguished career in Army research and development and technology, and now is applying these in the private sector in areas such as smart cities and many initiatives in Puerto Rico. He heads the National Center for Urban Operations and several commercial ventures, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Major General John Wharton. Thanks, Dr. Wells. And um, the first, first, let me thank Star Tides and George Mason University uh, for allowing me to participate in this forum, and and uh, and I really appreciate that. And uh, and also the Center for Resilient Sustainable Communities. Uh, and and the reason is, I think that the model is so good. It's listening, learning, then lasting, and then putting in solutions that will last over time. And I think it's so pertinent for what we're trying to do here today. As Dr. Wells said, I, you know, I'm involved in national security technology acceleration, and I think there's a little bit in Puerto Rico's case about nation building. Um, I am allowed to help advise government's nation industry on how to posture themselves for strategic roadmaps and an offset signal dependency in economies with technology. But the main point I want to talk to you today is about emerging technologies in Puerto Rico and the importance of coordinated, integrated approaches. So I really have two messages for you. And uh, one is that it's all about the people. And um, we can get enamored with technology, we can get enamored with all the, the bells and whistles, but there are basic needs we need to put in for the folks and people of Puerto Rico. And they may be emergency management systems, they may be quality of life systems, they may be basic life sustainment functions. We're going to talk about a little bit about that here today, about energy and water and, and some of the technologies that enable and provide us some of those functions that we need in Puerto Rico. Now, when you talk in terms of technology, there's several types. There's bridging, which are just marginal improvements. There's leap ahead, which bring us to a next level. And then there's disruptive, which really change the way we, we do business and the way we work. And so for Puerto Rico, a lot of these technologies based on where we are as a nation or as a country or as an island is going to be based on uh, disruptive technologies that get us to the next level. But we still have to remember at the lowest level, this spectrum of technology at the lowest level here, we got to put those basic needs and, and uh, support in. So Puerto Rico's recovery, re rebuilding and future is going to depend upon a synchronized, integrated and coordinated manner. And it's not going to just be with one entity, the federal government. It's got to be with federal. It's got to be with local. It's got to be public and private sectors, uh, non-governmental organizations. And, and as you know, right now, most of the support up to this point, other to the, up to the government funding, has been through private grants and family-owned um, funds. So Puerto Rico needs this, this non-partisan independent entity to represent its interest across all those sectors and interface uh, and synchronize and coordinate with a, a concerted plan on the way ahead. So we need to understand that the, the, the solutions involve people, organizations, and processes, as well as the technology. And then we hear a lot of talk about building a resilient, sustainable uh, uh, Puerto Rico. And a key to that is the energy solutions and the base of what we need to bring for uh, a smart Puerto Rico. But again, many other functions are, are, I want to define a little bit of that smart technology for you so that we know where we focus. Um, so job one is really uh, rebuilding that power grid and tying that energy base into, uh, into um, uh, the network and all things uh, assured. We want to have assured telecommunications, assured media forms, and things of that nature with with the, the grid and the power. It can't be done independent. We can't design a power grid and then design a telecommunications network uh, separately. They have to be integrated and in, uh, together. So let's first talk about future sustainable living and what's characterized that because this is at the basic level of technology that you bring in. And it's about the responsible balancing of people and resources. And it's, it's one where that people can meet the needs uh, today without compromising the ability of people in the future to meet their needs. And it's, between, it's striking the balance in this coordinated integrated approach between social economic requirements now and then in the future uh, with earth resources. So as we think into the future, um, we cannot design and rebuild, recover, rebuild and position uh, Puerto Rico for the future without addressing this integrated synchronized coordinated method. 
a, a good model to use, a litmus test of some of the UN goals for sustainable living. You know, um, there's there's uh, no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, affordable clean energy, clean water and sanitation. So many of those principles are going to carry over to what we're trying to do in Puerto Rico at the lowest level of let's just sustain the population and meet the needs and the requirements of the people that are there. But there's so many that line up well. And as you go to the higher end, where you talk about sustainable cities and communities of the future, that's inserting some of those uh, technologies. But, but Puerto Rico also talks in terms of you got to think about the ocean, the impact of climate, life on land and other factors that come into play that aren't just technology. It's what how do you use technology to enable a capability? So, so when I talk in terms of technology, I talk in terms of science, technology, then capability, and what's the effect we want to achieve here. And we can't outrun social reforms. And that's what we're seeing now in, in our country, in the United States. We're seeing, we put a lot of emphasis on technology, but do we have the assured industrial base to sustain us and keep us moving in the future? So what's important is that we break down those silos and have this interoperability and interdependence. And we have to set the foundation for this diverse, resilient, sustainable power supply and transmission system. That will be so inherent and important in smart and connected Puerto Rico. At the same time, we've got to look at what are the, the sectors that are going to bring opportunity to Puerto Rico. And again, they're going to be human sectors and human functions. I think some of you may have listened uh, to uh, Tom Friedman uh, talk about technology, globalization, climate change. Uh, Dr. Schwab um, also talked about the physical, digital, and biological spheres, and we talked about other technologies in there, synthetic biologic, biology, genetic engineering, robotics, and autonomous systems, nanotechnology, batteries, and things of that nature. But a lot of this attention now is being given to this word grind, the bio-robo-info nanotechnology, and combined with artificial intelligence advanced manufacturing, it gives us some unprecedented opportunities that we have for the future. So I wanna just quickly talk about the challenges because the challenges are de what determine the requirements, what determine the technology solutions. We know the environment is very heavy out there. We know there's gonna be an increase in category four and five storms. We're gonna have a sea level rise. There's gonna be high tidal, uh, tidal fl um, uh, fl uh, flooding in urban areas. And we're also gonna be experiencing drought. So what does drought mean? It means we need to bring the latest state of the art technologies in water purification, water production. Very first and foremost is that lack of resilient and assured energy. You know, when we lost hurricanes damage 25% of the, of the power lines, we lost 100% of the grid was inoperable. So we can't have that. So we'll talk a little bit about the technologies we have to bring in there and into the remote areas and, and places like Central Cordillera. Uh, Cord, uh, Cord, um, the workforce right now, 43% of the population is, you know, is living in poverty. So are we going to really go to the high extreme, uh, you know, or are we going to meet the people's needs and in in some of the basic needs and technology? So we talked about those requirements. We talked about um, a little bit, what is a smart, I want to move to smart connected Puerto Rico so I can get into the technology. It's about building an infrastructure that continuously improves, collects data, aggregates it, improves the life of your citizens. But it's also striking the right balance between protection, safety, and privacy. So these are all factors that as we harness this global revolution and in information with sensors and research that we do that. Now, when you talk in terms of smart connected island and the technologies, I think that's the ocean. I wanna talk in terms of what are the sectors that comprise that because that's important to a coordinated synchronized approach at rebuilding Puerto Rico. So there's the whole sector or vertical in the civilian market called energy. And is that clean, renewable? How do we use fossil fuels? How do we reduce uh, electric, electrical demands? You know, have we implemented hybrid technologies? Are we using solar? You know, what are the technology views uh, in energy? There's an intelligent infrastructure, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, the demands that infrastructure puts on the resources. Intelligent airports, the mobility, the transportation is a whole nother vertical or sector uh, in smart mobility. And, and you can go into manufacturing, you can go into education, you can talk about in um, uh, smart cities of uh, connecting the health, the government, food security, agriculture, many different sectors. 
So we don't want to boil the whole ocean here, but what we do want to know is that all these are connected into this network, this global mesh network that, that is providing us data so we can do management and we can understand. And from data, information, knowledge comes understanding. And in many cases, it comes decision making. And how do we how do we uh, manage the city, the, the 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 island? And that's where the Internet of Things come into play: edge of grid solutions, cloud computing, resiliency, cybersecurity, all very important players in that. So we talked a little bit about the modernization. It's very key. You've got to connect the energy infrastructure, rebuild the modernization as one of the basic backgrounds to this technology that we're inserting into uh, into Puerto Rico. And that integrates power, communications, transportation, uh, and really gives us the foundation as we connect into this network for smart Puerto Rico. But when you talk about the energy infrastructure, you drill down on the technologies of how you generate energy and what are your dependencies and what are alternate forms and how do you store that energy? Do you have state-of-the-art technologies that are storing that the, the best batteries out there uh, and, and grids, uh, solar panels and grids that store it, as well as what distributes, what are your distribution systems? Are they high capacity distributors? Are you using smart grids, microgrids? Are you being able to redistribute to the point of need of where you have energy requirements? So as we look to the future, we look at storage capabilities, we look at offshore, we look at clean renewable energies. And I think there's some other panel members that will discuss that. We also look at the distribution and transmission of those sources and the grids and how do we make those resilient? How do we harden them? How do we move the electric grids that are above ground and knowing that we have category four and five storms coming and how do we move those power lines and fiber connections below ground? So these are all things that we have to consider. We have to consider the smart micro grids and mini grids, right? We have to consider how they uh, provide us renewable power generation, increase uh, uh, battery storage, and then distribute it like we talked about a little bit before. Um, but what we find out is that with these smart grids, now we can distribute energy to individual homes, buildings. They, they, they can become virtual power plants with their own little grids and, uh, and help us there. When it comes to waste, how do you, what are the latest technologies to use waste, convert waste into energy? And then how does, how does smart grids help us in cyber resilience and now emphasize the work that we have to do on edge of the grid um, solutions? When you come to buildings and facilities, you'll find out that about 40% of all the global energy, 25% of all global water, and 40% of all global resources are, are being consumed by buildings. So you have to look at those technologies that are going to make those buildings facilities more efficient uh, and that part of that infrastructure. And for Puerto Rico, that's about half, that commercial sector is consuming about half of the island's electricity. So these are things that we have to work out and, and fix. Now, according to um, the... Um, the International Energy Agency, the new buildings offer the best ability to deploy passive heating and cooling designs. And these are things that, for example, the National Renewable Energy Lab are experts in and can advise on how to build energy efficient buildings and turning it into the right directions and optimizing that. All these contribute to the Internet of Things um, and, and support that, that, that network and that internet and, um, and um, as we plug into that system. On transportation, there's a lot of talk about smart autonomous vehicles. We've been involved in autonomous vehicles for 10 years. Where do they have applicability in Puerto Rico? Now, you know, if we move to electric vehicles, there probably are to reduce the, the dependency on, on fossil fuels. There's a lot to be probably said for electric vehicles, but also the connectivity electric vehicles into the network so you can monitor transportation flows and networks. Um, we talked a little bit about clean energy and, and sanitation. We talked about a little bit of the adaptability with hardening the systems, the sustainability and resilience that we need and the urban and regional environments. Now, let me talk about data and connecting into this thing called the network. Uh, big data is good and sometimes it may not be as good. It can lead us to uh, good smart decisions, but we can quickly overrun the general population who's just working on a phone or an iPhone or something like that. So how we use that, how we integrate with people and processes is very important. 
So the development of Puerto Rico and these technologies is a collaborative process involving engineers, telecommunication, professionals, designers, architects, governmental folks, local on the ground officials, and it has to be coordinated, synchronized and integrated. The network and telecommunications is going to be very key. How we plug into that. We can't have one part of the island, one contract building, one function that's not connected to the central hub, the command and control center, for lack of better words, so that we can manage the whole resources of the island. So let me just talk, and we talked a little bit about Internet of Things. I'll wrap up here very quickly um, on a couple points, but I want to talk about how do you prepare for the future? Because there's no shortage of technology, whether we're talking about fintech, we're talking about agriculture tech, we're talking about water and sensors and, and Internet of Things and all that, and the algorithms and software and data management systems. But what I think is very important here is that as you look to the future and how do you rebuild Puerto Rico, how do you give the local populist jobs? And I believe that's going to be through STEM. It's going to be through science, technology, education, mathematics, functions and disciplines there on the island. If 43% of the island is living in poverty, we have to give basic needs and meet those basic needs. And how do we create jobs? Well, those jobs are going to be in some of the same enduring functions that are national. They're going to be in cybersecurity. They're going to be in quantum information capabilities, artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics, energy, nanotechnologies, microelectronics, and, and excellence. So, so, um, um, so establishing a center of excellence in the R&D with these functions, bringing these into the universities and the curriculum will very, be very important for us. Finally, we need this ombudsman-like capability that synchronizes, coordinates, and acts as an independent capability for the island to synchronize and and have this command and control hub that everyone is reporting to. There's so much to talk about in digitizing Puerto Rico. I could go on and on about joint boards and centers and acquisition review boards and all the technology, the sensors. But in the event of time, I'm going to stop it there and just tell you that the success of Puerto Rico is recovery and rebuild will be depending upon a synchronized coordinated effort to, uh, and uh, across all sectors, federal, local, private, non-governmental grants to ensure that we get the ability or the uh, achieve the effect we're designing to take. So I hope you're there and I hope, um, I, uh, I know I ran through very quickly, but thank you very much for signing in and, and listening. Thank you. John, thank you very much. Uh, if I could just ask a question. Uh, yesterday, Don Tito uh, laid out a very um, uh, thoughtful and comprehensive program for a way ahead uh, that tied together incentives and a uh, management structure involving public and private uh, and um, uh, senior level officials. And I just wondered uh, uh, if I could get a dialogue going between the two of you on how the ideas that you have laid out uh, ties into what uh, Don Tito has talked about. So if I could ask first for Don Tito, uh, you know, to, uh, for so those who didn't hear yesterday's session, to talk a little bit about uh, your overview and then how it, uh, how, what General Wharton has talked about might fit into that, over. Well, I, I personally uh, thank you for uh, <clears throat> your exposition. I, I do agree and, and, you know, some things that I hadn't seen the way you do, but obviously I think one of the areas that it's important uh, for Puerto Rico uh, is not only resiliency in the way that we have discussed it before, but it's also, you know, being capable of having the energy that we need, as you said, having the technology that we need. So I, I, I had talked, for, you know, some time ago with Lynn about the, the issue of, uh, of, of becoming, you know, a, a smart island. Uh, and, and I think that uh, you talk also about the uh, increasing uh, levels of uh, the sea, uh, things that we are discussing uh, some of them with the uh, with the trust with the science trust, and I, I think that uh, that you know we should keep in touch because uh, uh, it, there are many sectors of what we want to do. Uh, we have a theme of, of, of you know of people in different areas, but also I'm working with this uh, group of former secretaries of economic development, and they're both uh, we have from both parties in Puerto Rico and both parties in the states. And we try to do everything by consensus uh, so that the opinion that comes out is something that 
we understand most of the people in Puerto Rico would agree as, as we, you know, the, the two biggest parties in Puerto Rico uh, are represented there. So, so I think it's important. And, and I think we, right now we've been talking to both candidates, uh, both one from the Democratic, uh, Popular Democratic Party and the other one from the uh, New Progressive Party. And, and I think uh, it, it's important that we analyze this outside of, of politics, and then that we bring it to Puerto Rico, no matter who wins, uh, the, the, so that we have a saying uh, uh, that can help. Puerto Rico can, you know, we've done it before, is what I say. Yeah. You know, yeah. we, we are the showcase of the Caribbean. Uh, we have the capacity, we have the people, we have one big problem, which is we have a million and a half people that could be working and are not. That's why we only have a 40% labor participation. Uh, right. And we have to get those people to work. They have not been trained to do anything now. So really they cannot get anything better and sometimes not even the minimum wage. So we have to train them and, and, and put them to work. So that's, that's part at the same time that we will lose jobs because of new technologies. So, so, so you know, it's, it's not an easy problem, but we right. can do it. Well, I think um, it's exactly uh, what I talk in terms of people know me, I always talk in terms of the big Venn overlap, because what you're saying is exactly what needs to occur. And it's that coordinated synchronized effort across all those agencies in an independent way of looking at it, not a parochial way and a view. And it's a graduated scale of the technologies. And when you think about the country and the island in this case, you think in terms of those sectors, right? Here's the critical infrastructure. Here's the emergency management system. Here's healthcare, here's education. And all those have to be synchronized across those lines of effort as you build your strategy and your implementation plan over time. And it's when you bring in. So very important is the basic life functions like we talked about energy, the grid, uh, tying it to the telecommunications so we have resilient energy and communications capability. And then we have that network that we can then grow over time, implement capabilities starting with basic life functions, but as we build to a more progressive island and build those to become a smart connected island. And these are the kinds of things that I get to help other countries do and universities and, and for them reorient their program, countries develop economic plans that keep them uh, postured in the future. I, I see, for example, the pandemic itself, uh, it's a, a combination of a problem and, a, and an opportunity. And, and we've learned a lot. For example, I have learned a lot. I realize right now that we need half of the cars that we have, which means that we're going to spend, you know, a much less in, in, in oil costs that, that, that goes out of Puerto Rico and the cars also go out of Puerto Rico. These are two industries that will suffer, but it makes a lot of sense that we have a lot of people working from their homes and therefore they don't need a car. I, I don't have a car now. If I have to go out, I go, I take Uber. Uh, and I'm not going out unless I, I really have to. So, so, so the reality is that that is one thing and that's going to affect many things. But at the end, it's gonna be positive because you're gonna have more people working from home. I have, my wife is a register uh, of, of the deeds in Puerto Rico and she's doing more work now with her team from home, producing much more than she was uh, before. So, 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 you know, we have to look at those opportunities things that are gonna happen. They're gonna happen because they make economic sense. So, so you know, we have to plan for that. And just my last comment um, is exactly right. I, Dantito, I agree with you hundred percent. And, and, you know, there's a recovery, there's a rebuild, and then there's a posturing for the future. And, you know, we were slowed down by the hurricanes, by COVID and things like that, and then there's a new norm. So here's the post COVID, rebuild, recovery, rebuild, and then posture for the future. And it's exactly with what you're saying. Dr. Wells. Um, we have a question from, uh, from Hildeberto and we'll take that question and then go on to the panel. Mm -hmm. Hildeberto, you're in mute. Yeah, uh, sorry, I hadn't realized that. Uh, greetings, General. Um, I know what you've proposed is tremendous, and that's how we need to push it forward. Uh, so it's a question as to who do you envision or from your experience um, in implementing these uh, concepts or these recommendations, both 
national and foreign, uh, who's best to lead this effort? Is it the government itself or is it a combination of government and civil society? Uh, we need to have accountability and, and we need to move this needle, you know, as we're stuck uh, three years after Hurricane Maria, still fumbling through and, and trying to make headway. Who do you see from your experience that is best suited or could be best suited to, to lead this uh, proposal that you're unveiling today? Well, I, I think you have to get the right functional experts that come from the right sectors. And again, it, 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 there, it's apolitical, right? It's, it's who are the functional experts who have done this, who have built country plans, who have led strategic roadmaps, roadmaps who have, who have built, uh, built nations and nation building. But I think that you know, it's a combination in a very generic sense from industry, academia, and government entities, right? That are, is the combination is the base because the industry and academia have some of the most premier thought leaders in these subjects. So it's really finding the right team and every case is different. If you're talking to Middle East, some of those are to offset uh, sole dependent economies. When we talk about Puerto Rico, we have many options there of opportunities of where you wanna go. So not only are they the public private partnerships, industry, academia, and, uh, and, and government activities where there's expertise a lot of the folks that we have here, like the National Renewable Energy Lab, can tell you about the latest technologies as we look to the future in, in bringing to the island. So who are the functional executors and operators that can oversee that, provide governance, and kind of put a synchronized, coordinated plan in time, over time, uh, in? So, so um, that's the best way I would answer it now. It's forming the team that are the functional experts in those sectors it's based on what are the requirements, uh, one, that the need for the island foremost, and over time, that, that group can expand, it can collapse, but it's gotta have that central governance that can make decisions, and you do that through joint, joint activities, joint boards, and things of that nature. But these are things that we can help with and help you think through down the road and, and that kind of thing. Um, so public-private partnerships, industry, academia, experts, uh, and some technical functional experts uh, from the appropriate agencies, and you form that team. Uh, and people, of course, from Puerto Rico, the experts on the ground who bring that expertise and who inform that body and, and uh, who, are, who are the Sherpas who know what's going on down there so we can uh, focus on the right activities. Thank you. So, uh, so John, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me now turn the panel over to uh, Juan. Uh, I believe we're right about uh, at uh, uh, on schedule at twelve thirty. So, uh, Juan, over to you. I think you're muted. You're muted. Uh, Juan, can you can you hear me? So, so Hilberto, do you uh, would you want to start off uh, start off the panel so, we'll, so we can get connectivity back with Juan? Hi, uh, I'm back. Um, Good. Okay. Okay. So, let me get the uh, video. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm uh, for those who. Do you know me? I'm uh, Juan Figueroa. I'm the entrepreneurship advisor and the associated researcher of the Puerto Rico Science Research Technology and Innovation Trust. And uh, but really, my function is in grants. I work with the, uh, the equity free, basically for SBIR, and I also work in providing funds to Puerto Rico. Uh, from the federal government, but all around technology and innovation. So today, um, when, I, when I look back to all the presentations and what's going on with, with Puerto Rico, uh, of taking the poor me poor days of a group of innovative, innovative people that have been very much involved in creating new technologies, 
of being innovative and creating jobs. And these are the, the people who are going to participate in, in, in this seminar. Uh, the group is formed by Roger Grace, uh, Lucas Arzola. Uh, we have uh, Jennifer Herrera, who was our was one of the students at one of Linton's seminars that coordinated by Gilberto and Resiliency. And finally, Jose Ramos, uh, who is uh, an inventor and has a lot of ideas and uh, the other thoughts that I want to share is that even though the title of this session is Puerto Rico and the solutions uh, will work in Puerto Rico, but the people that are going to be in this panel think beyond Puerto Rico and every solution or idea that is presented worldwide. And we want Puerto Rico to be the center and to generate new ideas and new opportunities to, to the rest of the world. Ambitious, but hey, that's, uh, that's what we want to do. Um, so the first speaker will be Roger Grace, and he was is to give us a, a little background uh, on his and his experience, and then he's going to and then after that, I make the other introduction. Finally, we go to, to have Roger to speak. But the next person that I want to, okay, Roger, introduce yourself and so a little bit of your background. And you're in mute. Roger, okay. So we're gonna start then with uh, Lucas Arzola. I'm unmuted. Ready? I'm unmuted. Are we ready? You're you're muted. Uh, are we ready? Uh, Juan, shake yeah, your head. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Let's start with you, as, as we were saying. So give us a little bit of of, of your background. I want to go around the panelists, and then we start the presentation. Go ahead, Roger, and brief this background on you. Yeah, okay, so a little background on me. I, uh, I met Juan uh, as a result of uh, uh, participating in the NSF program, the SBIR, SCPR program, where I was one of the panelists. I did this for uh, about seven years. Uh, my background is uh, I am an engineer with a bachelor's and master's in electrical engineering from Northeastern uh, University, and I did the uh, MBA program at UC Berkeley. Um, I've been a design engineer in the microwave and high frequency uh, electronics business for 13 years before I decided to go into the marketing uh, business and the sensor business. I had my own sensor consulting, my own consulting firm, Roger Grace Associates, for uh, 38 years. And the areas that I deal with are uh, semiconductors, but more, more recently in sensors and MEMS. So I, I very much specialize with my, my clients who, uh, who are in the MEMS and sensors industry. And my job uh, is to help them commercialize technology. And by commercializing technology, I mean to help them do market research, to understand the competitive environment, to understand what's unique about their product, to understand the competence that, these, that they have. And then once we figure this out and try to create the product, uh, um, once that's done, my job is to help promote the product and promote the company and bring the product and the company into the marketplace and set up chains of distribution. So I pretty much work as a vice president of uh, marketing for lots of these small startup companies, and I tend to work with small startup companies. So uh, that's, that's my story, and, and uh, I'm sticking to it. Thank you, Roger. And I would like to move on to Lucas Arzola. Good afternoon. My name is Lucas Arzola, and uh, I lead the operations for Parallel 18, which is an international startup accelerator based in Puerto Rico that is affiliated with the Puerto Rico Science, Technology, and Research Trust. So basically, my job is to be a bit more on the ground to execute the vision of the trust around innovation. 
on our public policy in Puerto Rico to help more entrepreneurs go global from the island. Uh, the program has been operating for five years now, and in that time, we've accelerated over 200 companies uh, that are mostly tech-based and that can provide solutions not only to Puerto Rican clients, but also to customers uh, globally. Um, another one of my hats is I lead PE Team Ventures, which is a vehicle for investing in the best companies that come out from the accelerator. Uh, and help them continue growing and uh, operating from Puerto Rico. Um, in that amount of time, we've made 24 investments, uh, a little bit over two and a half million dollars. So basically I'm very much focused in helping Puerto Rican companies change their mindset and go from a developed concept or a prototype into commercialization and exporting from Puerto Rico. And then also helping international companies come to Puerto Rico to do business and bring new innovations to the island. And I'm happy to tell you more about how we do that later on. Uh, thank you, Lucas. So I'm just gonna go collect words. So I would like to hear um, uh, Jennifer. And Jennifer, as I mentioned, was one of our participants in, in these courses that Lynn and Alberto and Annie Mustafa put together. And I would like to hear what she has to say, how to help Puerto Rico and the world. Jennifer, you're, you're mute or muted. Hello, Jennifer. Okay, since our time is limited, then I will, move, I will move on to Jose Ramos. That is, has a lot of tremendous ideas. Jose, you're mute. Hello, everybody. My name is Jose Ramos. I don't know if you can, can you hear me well? Uh, can, we do, can, at least I do. Yeah. Juan Figueroa introduced me as an entrepreneur. Indeed, I am. I'm actually Puerto Rican. I was born uh, in the United States, but I was raised in Puerto Rico, and I graduated from the High de la Universidad de Puerto Rico. I was the first in class. Um, but I, I left the island many, many years ago and wandered into a life of entrepreneurship all over the world. I've lived in most of the territories of the United States, from Guam to Micronesia to American Samoa to the Virgin Islands. So I know that side of, uh, of the United States more than I know the rest of the country. My role is I'm the CEO right now of an organization called Kin Keepers. Our aspiration is to try to help solve the problem of aging care uh, in places like Puerto Rico and around the world. And we've come out with an innovative solution that we're just bringing to market right now, um, primarily in the United States, but also in Puerto Rico. Um, my own educational background is I went to Cornell and Harvard. So I'm also a venture capitalist and private equity investor uh, from years past. I've developed organizations that I've successfully sold to places like Visa International. And right now I'm committed to leading a worldwide team to tackling this problem of aging care. Uh, Jose, could you tell them um... Why do your solution fit into, into Puerto Rico, the percentage of uh, elderly and the, the, the impact? Yes, I'm actually have a presentation that I'll give to you guys a little bit later. But okay, so we'll okay. wait. Don't, we'll don't worry about it. We'll wait. Okay, okay thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, Jennifer, are you, are you there? Okay, so we will have uh, a chance uh, later to, to hear from, from Jennifer. Uh, she's connected from Puerto Rico. So why don't we, um, then we go, on to, we go to Roger and he will tell us what some of the solution that he has and what he's gonna bring to Puerto Rico. And actually I hope Lucas is listening to this well because these are people that would fit very well with the parallel team. Jose, uh, Roger, we're all yours. Tell us all about the, the things well, that you're, I, I, you can I, do for Puerto Rico. Great. I don't want you to think that I'm a gringo because I'm not. As I tell, as I tell my dear friend Juan, my, uh, 
My background is uh, Brazilian and Portuguese, so I'm first generation American, but uh, my name was changed to protect the guilty, I guess. But uh, I just wanted to uh, share that with you. So Juan and I talked a little bit about this, uh, what I should talk about. And, and what I suggested, and, and Juan was in agreement with this, is to talk about sensors and to talk about sensors in a way uh, in the concept of resilience. And, and why are we talking about resilience and sensors? Because Juan and I and a bunch of my colleagues at this, this organization that I belong to right now that's also having their yearly meeting, and I jumped off that conference to join you guys, the uh, Comms World 2020 Conference. We were planning on having this conference in, uh, in Puerto Rico and working with Northeastern University in Boston where I uh, went to engineering school. And we spent a lot of time talking about resilience. And, and, and the reason for that was that it was happening right after the big earthquake, uh, the big hurricane came in and wiped out the island. We started figuring out how can we talk about commercialization of technology and um, how it can support the concept of resilience. So um, the comments I'm gonna make right now are sensor or sensor system based. And they're gonna talk about the concept of, uh, of how do they support a resilience application? Because uh, who, who knows, you know, I'm in Florida, I'm in Southwest Florida, we have hurricanes down here too. Uh, you know, my roof got pretty much damaged at the same time your island got damaged. So I can understand what's going on with hurricanes. So uh, I wanted to talk about resilience uh, from, a model, from, a, from a model point of view where the first part of the model is planning. Uh, you, need, you need a plan for these, these situations, uh, whatever they may be. Uh, they may be hurricanes, they may be fires. I live in California when I don't live here in Florida. As you probably know, we're having incredible fires in California. So any of, any of these environmental disasters are really the, uh, the forcing function of creating a resilient strategy. And then the next thing we have to do is we have to plan what kinds of systems uh, and especially sensor-based systems can we deploy, can we integrate to be able to make measurements, keep, keep word here as measurements. How can we measure the environment so we know how to respond. And my, one of my favorite st statements is, if you can't measure it, you can't solve the problem. You, know, it, you need to be able to make the measurement. So the name of the game is, we need to deploy lots of sensors into, uh, into the market, in, into the environment. And then the next thing we have to do is again, from a planning point of view, we have to understand what kinds of infrastructure needs to be created to take the information from the sensors and use that information judiciously to be able to solve whatever problems may happen. For example, water pollution. Two or three people, uh, one especially uh, during the comms conference talked about being able to make water drinkable. So you know, I'll connect one with this gentleman because that's important. So that's kind of the overall system of uh, sensor-based uh, uh, contributions to resilience. So let's just talk about some of, the, uh, some of the areas that sensing technology can help. The first area of sensing technology, and it's quite important. And the, uh, the other thing I wanted to comment on very, very importantly is all of these sensors are at TRL technology ready level nine, eight. They are truly commercialized. You can buy them off the shelf. This is not something you have to go to Berkeley or Stanford or MIT to get where it's still being developed. This stuff you can buy from a DigiKey catalog, for example. The challenge is how do you connect these sensors into a system to be able to develop the information that you need? So uh, I've written several papers on the concept of, of infrastructure sensing. So let's talk a little bit about infrastructure sensing. Big issues on bridges, big issues on dams and levees, big issues on buildings. And the fact of the matter is there are lots of sensors that are out there, especially accelerometers and motion sensors that are currently being used right now uh, to be able to monitor 
health of, of infrastructure. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been out to uh, California, to Northern California, have driven from San Francisco out to Sacramento, past Berkeley, through the Cartinas Narrows in San Francisco Bay. That bridge has been uh, totally instrumented with a suit of sensors that my colleague, Jerry Lynch at the University of Michigan has helped put together. So those sensors basically collect data 24 seven, send that information to the cloud and monitor the vibration levels on that bridge because vibration levels can pretty much give you an indication of, of potential failures of that bridge. Same thing's being done in buildings. Same thing is being done in levees. And, and the bottom line is Jerry Lynch uh, and his sensors. Ro Roger, your, your sound is so cut off, you know, or I am having a, a can ever, can difficult. Can hear me? I can hear you fine. I think it's fine. Uh, the bandwidth or? So as I was saying, that, that infrastructure is a very, very important part of this whole concept uh, of, of trying to uh, monitor the environment uh, and it's part of the resilience. The next area uh, from, a, let's say, the, pol the pollution and fires that we're seeing in Northern California, which is really, really uh, incredible. Uh, again, there are many sensors that are available. Many companies are making gas sensors. Many of them are making them from printed electronics, which is one of the areas that I'm uh, talking about uh, this afternoon in my presentation. And it's a commercially available product. So the name of the game is there needs to be a deployment of these sensors and not only uh, on light posts or road signs or trees, but these sensors can go into next generation iPhones like iPhone 13. I just understood that there was an iPhone 12 launched this week. So there are these sensors that are low cost, very small, they could be integrated and we could in fact have a world network of sensors and everybody that has a phone could be part of that data acquisition program. So again, this is, this is an, again, something that could be deployed in Puerto Rico or uh, Napa Valley to help uh, people uh, understand where the problems were and how to solve them. Uh, I talked about water quality monitoring. I, I've seen numerous, numerous, uh, pictures on the PBS NewsHour of what happened in Puerto Rico and what's continuing to happen in Puerto Rico as a result of the hurricane. And this happens all over the world. Uh, it's not only because of hurricanes, because of a lot of reasons. Floods, you know, you have, you have uh, floods and all of a sudden you've got pollution of the, uh, the drinking water. And, and the name of the game is how do we monitor water and then also, how do we how do we make water safe uh, for for drinking? Again, sensors are be and then here in Southwest Florida, we have this place called Lake Okeechobee, which is kind of in the center of the state that provides a great deal of irrigation to uh, a lot of the sugarcane fields uh, uh, in the center of, of Florida. And one of the problems is there's a great deal of pollution in Lake Okeechobee, and I work with the Florida Economic Development uh, Group to try to understand where the problems were and how sensors can be used in Lake Okeechobee and other areas to be able to monitor where pollution was being uh, created and trying to solve the problem of, of uh, shutting down those poll polluters. So, you know, so the bottom line here is that the technology exists. What needs to happen is funding, like in everything else. What needs to happen is what I call system architecture. What needs to happen is that a bunch of very, very smart people, whether they be in Napa Valley, uh, through uh, University of California uh, uh, educational systems, or in Puerto Rico, or anywhere, where we start to make cities smart, by deploying all these various sensors so we can understand how to minimize wasted energy, how to optimize lighting in cities, how to uh, track pollution, 
how to uh, track water quality and to be able to provide uh, information to the uh, inhabitants of that organ of that community to be able to help them live their lives in a much higher quality of life point of view and help them respond to major disasters like the fires in Northern California that are currently raging and the effects of the hurricane, which still linger in your island. So uh, the bottom line is uh, um, the technology is there. Uh, what's needed is money. Uh, and what's needed is a plan to create a very large data acquisition network based on existing sensor technologies using things like the cloud, uh, 5G, communication strategies, power strategies uh, to uh, be able to optimize the uh, efficacy of these sensors. So uh, that's kind of what I have to say. And uh, uh, I'm going to have to jump off this call at 2 o'clock for my other conference. But uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have on this topic. Okay, um, any questions that, and uh, Roger, after you finish that, you can come back for the, for the tail end of the, of the presentation unless somebody has a quick question. I just had a One quick question, question. <clears throat> and, and that is what unique infrastructures do you see in Puerto Rico that um, uh, you, you mentioned many in California and things that uh, could apply, uh, could require special treatment or? Well, again, I, I've not been to Puerto Rico since I was a college student and went there, went there for spring break. So that's a very long time ago. But uh, based on my conversations with Juan, which are rather frequent, I, I see, and based on what I watch on TV and what I read in the New York Times, I, I feel that water, uh, water could be a big issue. I also see power is a big issue. People don't have power. A lot of the power lines have been destroyed. How can there be uh, you know, people using gasoline generators to create power, to keep their food fresh, to be able to do things like that? So, I, you know, the name of the game is really having to go and do a deep dive into where, where the problems are in Puerto Rico. But, uh, but the name of the game is the solutions are out there for any problems. I can assure you of that. If there are any problems out there that current technology can't survive, I'll buy... I'll buy everybody here a drink at the Hotel El San Juan when we all get together next. Because I was at the Hotel El San Juan and I snuck in there when I was a college student and I looked like a college student and they threw me out. But I did go there and I know how beautiful it is and I want to go back. But the bottom line is technology exists. It's all about creation of solutions using existing technology and deployment of those networks. Let's call them sensor networks that work collaboratively to collect information, send it to the cloud, crunch the information, send it back and make the information actionable so people know what to do and, 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 and how to mitigate the downside of a disaster. Hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. My pleasure. If there's no more, I'm going to jump off and I'll be back uh, in about 15 minutes. Okay, Juan? All right. All right. So let's uh, thank you, Roger. Um, then I would like to, to hear about uh, all the good things that Lucas is doing. And uh, I'll go ahead, Lucas. Lucas. All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Once again, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about what the Puerto Rico Science Trust is doing towards innovation in Puerto Rico. Some of it has to do with resiliency and some of it has to do with our general mission to accelerate the startup and tech ecosystem in Puerto Rico, which is one of our main missions. Um, one of our goals really is to change the mindset around entrepreneurship in Puerto Rico both how Puerto Rico is perceived around the world and also how uh, entrepreneurs are able to think about what they can do in terms of growing their businesses. And I mention this because 
Puerto Rico is an island, so many times the mindset tends to be a bit more local. The entrepreneurs think that their market is their town or is Puerto Rico. And, you know, we help them realize that it's much larger than that, that they can really tweak their solutions to uh, address a much larger client base all around the world. And so with that mission, we launched Parallel 18 five years ago. Um, one thing that is important to mention is that, you know, entrepreneurs are very resilient and adaptable and they have been um, adapting to a lot of the challenges that are happening, you know, most recently COVID-19, but even before that, the hurricane 2017 and the earthquakes at the beginning of the year. So from, from crisis, we see a lot of opportunity that has uh, grown. And, you know, in a sense, we've had a head start in terms of uh, events that have spurred innovation in Puerto Rico on the ground, but also having a program in place that can help these entrepreneurs grow a lot faster. Um, so Parallel 18 is basically focused on economic development. We help uh, entrepreneurs uh, through a business training program that helps them reduce the risk of launching their and growing their companies. That is done through grants that are provided uh, from funds from the Puerto Rico Science Trust. And we started with our international five month program. So basically not only for Puerto Rican companies, but also entrepreneurs from outside Puerto Rico that can strategically impact the island and insert themselves in the local economy. Um, we do this because we realized that we wanted to jumpstart and accelerate the startup ecosystem in the island. And one of the fastest ways to do that was to also bring entrepreneurs from abroad to launch and grow their solutions in Puerto Rico. And in that way, uh, add to the mindset of the local entrepreneurs that want to grow from the island. So in a way, it's a community building program that has successfully um, leveraged and, and connected not only entrepreneurs, but also mentors, uh, investors, companies, and, and really you know, bringing a whole village together around this mission. Um, from the hurricane, we added pre-18, which is our pre-accelerator program. We wanted to more directly impact entrepreneurs after Hurricane Maria. So we basically created our own program to help nurture these local entrepreneurs that if they're able to validate a new concept and reach the market, then they can get support from our Parallel 18 program. So in total, these entrepreneurs can be supported for a total of eight months and get $60,000 as grants to launch and grow their businesses. So, so we, can, we can safely say that Parallel 18 is, is likely one of the friendliest accelerator programs in the world because we do that because we give them comprehensive support, but also we don't take any equity uh, in the companies. So we actually help these companies and provide grants equity free because our mission is more social to help the ecosystem grow. Um, so entrepreneurs don't pay for their program. Um, they don't give up equity, rather they get a lot of the support um, to continue growing. Um, so there's a, there's a third program that's part of Parallel 18, which is Pete Ventures, which then takes the top performers and invests in them to continue growing. We realized that a need locally is, um, was first, more entrepreneurs growing their companies. And after five years of doing the program, that has changed. We have, as I said, over 200 companies growing from Puerto Rico that are very promising. And now the next biggest challenge is having more local capital that can provide investment in these companies so that they can continue growing here. Because if there's not enough local capital for investment, then these companies are gonna go elsewhere to find it. And that will affect our retention. They'll probably move. Uh, part of their team or their company somewhere else, which is going to diminish the impact of the products and services they're offering and that they have those impacts of growing in Puerto Rico. So basically, Parallel 18 today is the three programs that I mentioned. Um, I want to very quickly provide some examples of industries that we are supporting in Puerto Rico because all of this is in the context of bring innovation to solve different problems for Puerto Rico. Um, so one example of that is uh, the health industry. Obviously, it's an industry that's very important in Puerto Rico. A lot of pharmaceutical 
companies uh, in the island. Um, we have um, had a company called Brainhide that does um, artificial intelligence to help uh, doctors easily book uh, patients that don't have any missed calls. And this company became particularly important when uh, the hurricane happened and more appointments were needed to, to be managed by, by the medical offices that were working. So this company has been growing a lot because they can provide that new technology capability to, to medical offices. Um, another company uh, example is Entrega Meds, more in the logistics sector. They were focusing on delivering uh, medicines and after the hurricane happened, obviously the infrastructure collapsed, uh, pharmacies were not operating. So this company was able to handle delivery of medicines, not only in Puerto Rico, but also the Caribbean, which is really helpful um, after the hurricane. So again, these were ideas that were around before. These were companies that were operating, but because the problem they were solving became much more important after the hurricane, these companies were able to grow significantly and help bring quality of life to more citizens in Puerto Rico. Uh, a company that's more recent in, in our portfolio is called um, Raincoat. They are focused on insurance and they are particularly relevant to climate change. Basically when the hurricane happened, it took insurance companies uh, over a year to pay on policies that were in place. And there's even claims at this point after three years that have not been addressed by insurance companies. So this, this is a huge problem in terms of not being able to put money back into the economy to help um, people recover after uh, an emergency passes. So this company um, created a solution for parametric insurance that uses blockchain to automatically pay out policies after an event happens. It could be a hurricane, it could be an earthquake. As long as the policy is in place based on the severity of the emergency on a particular location, then automatically payouts happen uh, in as uh, short as few days so that you know, we can get money in the pockets of citizens a lot faster. So I know I don't have that much time, so I just wanna give um, one more example of a company called Produce, uh, more focused on agriculture and food security. Um, the changes after some of these phenomena in Puerto Rico have made it uh, uh, more uh, more difficult for farmers to be able to um, distribute their produce and their, their crops around Puerto Rico. So this platform is able to take on the technology part of people being able to like pay for products and then the delivery of fresh fruit and vegetables directly to people's homes. So I wanna close by saying, you know, these are only four examples of over 200. And we're really happy that through the presence of the Puerto Rico Science Trust and Parallel 18, we have enabling technologies that are in place in the island that we're actually nurturing through a well-structured program. We're also connectors to help them get clients in the ecosystem. And all of this is making Puerto Rico more competitive uh, with new technologies that are adopted by corporations, nonprofits, the government to, to be more efficient, but also more innovative products and services available to local consumers. So definitely um, we're looking to grow this even more because there's a lot of room for Puerto Rico to be a global player in innovation and a lot of the ingredients to make Puerto Rico a great place to do business are, are present. So I have some colleagues here like Juan and, and Gilberto, we're all on the same team of the Puerto Rico Science Trust and we're very much focused through different initiatives to connect this whole ecosystem from idea and research all the way to commercialization and exportation. Uh, Lucas, uh, could you give us about a, a minute or so of your background so that we we can understand how people, the team fits in, in these efforts? You're mute, or you're muted. Okay, I'm back. I was born and raised uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, my background is actually chemical engineering. I lived in California for eight years and when I was there, I was actually an entrepreneur myself. I launched a biotech company and an education company before. I also helped create a student startup incubator for University of California in Davis. And I also taught entrepreneurship at the university. So I came back to Puerto Rico 
to basically you know launch Parallel 18 uh, as its first director of operations and really bringing all of that together to help structure the program as a training program that was very practical on entrepreneurship, uh, managing grants uh, that can see these companies to grow and help them be strategic and also advise them day to day on what their needs are to be more successful. And then finally, I've been able to also teach here in Puerto Rico at the Universidad Sagrado Corazon and really my day to day is just helping entrepreneurs every day with advice, with contact, with support, and more recently with investment. So very happy to be part of a great organization like the Trust who's really looking at Puerto Rico uh, and what it needs for, for the future and then developing programs to implement that uh, on the ground level. Juan, you're on, you're on mute. Um, sorry, thank you, Lucas. Um, I have some questions for you later. So uh, let's move to Jose Ramos and uh, listen, so his innovation could really good Puerto Rico. Uh, go ahead, Jose. Uh, all right. Uh, well, thank you all for uh, for being here and, and listening to us. Um, I think I would be interested in the $60,000 grant I just heard about. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm going to show you a presentation that I think um, will be um, a foundation for some of the things we've talked about so far of how to uh, add to the growth of Puerto Rico by using technology, improving the economy. But before <coughs> we can get on with doing that effectively, we have to address the social context of the island, which is one of uh, increasing aging population. So this presentation is about how to solve the problem of aging care. Let me, if you don't mind, let me just share my screen a moment. And I need the host to enable me to share the screen. So you go into the, I guess, the participant window and enable me to be able to share. Linda, can, can you help them? Okay. Uh, to give access to the to this to share his screen. Get it? Okay, let's see if I can share now. Still, I'm still disabled in my ability to share the screen. If you go into if you go into share screen, there's one click that says one participant can share at a time. There's another one that says multiple participants can share simultaneously. You might try that one. But the other thing is, I'll designate uh, see if I can designate him as a co-host. Um. This is Jose, right? Yeah, Jose Ramos. I'll keep waiting until you guys uh, figure uh, it out. I just made you a co-host. So yeah, okay. Like to share. Yep, it looks like it, it worked. So okay. let me let me start sharing. And then all I need somebody to tell me is that they can see the screen. Can see. All right, so let's start off. Um, at, least, at least I can, yes. Uh, let me get rid of some of these things uh, so you guys can see better. So we're going to be talking about sustainable aging care for Puerto Rico, which is another inconvenient truth. Um, and uh, this chart probably explains the challenge pretty well. We have a life expectancy that is happening all over the world, um, and particularly in countries that have adopted a one-child policy like China or that have shrinking populations like in Japan. But what is interesting is that Puerto Rico tops the list. It tops the list in countries with aging populations, not because of a one-child policy and not because of a situation of uh, a shrinking marriage population. It tops the list because people have been leaving the island. Puerto Rico has had an exodus of a younger um, productive citizens for the last decade. And as a result of that, Puerto Rico's elder ratio to its population now exceeds 38%. Out of an island of almost 3 million people, 825 are considered elders. And that makes Puerto Rico right up there at the top of the list as an aging destination. Now, because of that, we have to ask ourselves, is this the best we can do? Can we deal with aging by putting people in nursing homes where things are expensive? I don't think so. We just heard that the unemployment in Puerto Rico is about 40%. There's no way you're going to be able to solve the problem by delegating it abroad. In addition to that, 
the aging situation gets confused with morality. As soon as any island or population starts to find uh, a way to talk about aging care that makes it convenient to not have to deal with the problem, you are now walking on a precipice of morality. And let me show you how that has happened around the world. In Japan, where I've been out to give dialogues, because of the shrinking population, many elders die alone in their own homes. And because uh, uh, Japanese do not want to work in mortuaries, those bodies are not discovered until days after they're, they're dead. And as a result of that, when they do find these bodies, it becomes a problem of what do you do with them? And what they had to do in most of Japan is take those bodies to hotels, which are now called corpse hotels, where they use the air conditioning to preserve the, bed, the body as best they can until they can be cremated. The same thing happens in India right now. In India, because of the fact that you have a young, booming population that wants to get on with developing skills and attaining success, it is now becoming difficult for taking care of elders who have become um, an inconvenience. And so this is an example that happened just last year where three sons took their mother to the steps of a crematorium and abandoned her. The same thing goes on in other countries, in Mexico and Indonesia, Elders are taken to the dump heaps and abandoned to fend for themselves. In the United States, if you're looking, you will see that more and more of the seniors that are, uh, you will see more and more of the homeless that are on the street are elders. And since we've become accustomed to seeing these homeless, we don't even recognize that they're becoming increased among our ranks. In China, the one child policy has led to the fact that now a couple is trying to figure out how to deal with four aging parents and they simply don't have the means. And in China, there is no long-term care provision. And then coming back to in general population, we are finding ourselves at clashing with a culture where most promised to their parents that they would never go away, that they would never be put in institutions. That is not happening. And to make the point most critically, I want to point to you what has happened just recently with the pandemic in a country as advanced as Sweden. Another example of how culture can get in the way of morality. In Sweden, recently they decided that the best way to handle the pandemic was to depend on herd immunity. And what they did with elders in nursing homes was a crime. Instead of trying to protect the elders, they went into elder home cares and they gave them morphine. As a result, Sweden stands above all European nations with the most number of deaths uh, in senior elder, hair, elder, hair home, elder care homes than any other nation. The dilemma is that you may have to still build an economy while considering how you're going to care for mom. And that dilemma is powerfully felt in Puerto Rico. So people say, well, if I have the dilemma that I have to take care of my mother, because I can no longer leave her in a nursing home, you either go down the left side or the right side of this chart. On the left side, you may say, no, I can't handle it. We constantly are fighting. And so I'm going to try to put her in an institution. But the problem is that coronavirus has now made that difficult to do. And I can tell you that the talks that you hear of vaccines will create a false sense of security. Elder populations, immune systems, do not respond well to vaccines. In fact, if you look at the people who die from the common flu and you take some time to look at the statistics, you will see that most of them are elder people. The bottom line is that just because you get a vaccine does not guarantee that the elder, most vulnerable populations will have any kind of solution. So you're left with considering the right side. I have to bring my mother home. And if you're going to do that, you better be asking for questions of how do you empower yourself? Well, that's where we come in. We're trying to help people with a solution that makes it possible that they can bring elders home and at the same time build an economy. So let me lay out for you the strategy or the approach we've taken. We started off by observing that most pets have a sixth sense. You can feel and you can communicate with animals without using words. They have an ability to sense and respond, and that creates a sense of comfort. 
In addition to that, humans have a sixth sense. If you look at an older person with a baby, neither of them are capable of communicating with words, and yet through emotions they communicate. Machines have a sixth sense too. We have recently seen the proliferation of assistive devices from companies like Amazon and Google, and if you're in China, a company called Baidu. And those devices are starting to pick up greater and greater ability to sense the environment. The most recent one, just announced by Amazon, which is the Echo Show 10, not shown here, is a device that comes with a swivel base that's capable of turning itself in the direction of the voice that it hears its owner. And not only can it turn itself in the direction of your voice, it can sense your presence and it can be programmed to response. So what I'm trying to communicate to you is that the ability of systems using artificial intelligence to manifest some level of comprehension and understanding is here now. This is not science fiction, it is here today. And because it is here today, you can expect an acceleration of other technologies. If you have a person who can't talk, you might say, well, how does that benefit them? This is something from MIT called Alter Ego. It's a headset that you wear over your ear and it reads the electrochemical signal that goes from your brain to your vocal cords and allows you to speak. Again, this is here today. Now, because of these technologies being present, you can start developing technologies or solutions that can communicate with elders that have some level of enchantment. Here's a slide from um, a professor at Cornell University where he took the Pixar lamp that everybody knows about in movies and made it mechanic, mechanically viable. And what he discovered is that you don't have to develop robots to communicate with people because robots, in fact, have this um, perception, uh, expectation of behavior that frustrates people. But if you develop solutions in devices that are not human-like, in fact, like a lamp, you can actually have these devices be more endearing to seniors. We use this approach at kingkeepers.com. So what I'm communicating to you is that we're moving to an interface to a digital world where communicating with an increasingly smart environment is becoming more and more possible. And that's encouraging because that makes it possible for Puerto Ricans to build an economy while caring for elders at home. How are we going to do that? The way to do that is communication. So let me share what we are doing. We developed an evolving artificial intelligence pet that looks and, and behaves as an apparatus, like perhaps a camera or a TV or a radio that seniors can relate to in the 1950s. The beauty of that is that they don't have to have a younger person explain it to them. In fact, they are being the ones to explain it to their grandchildren. But that apparatus will evolve and absorb understanding and data from the seniors in time to get to a point where it can become an intelligent, trusted advisor and a companion. Now, the, the key that we are using to build this is the observation that as people advance in age, and I've already pointed to the fact that Puerto Rico has a pretty advanced population, you may be aware of the fact that different kinds of memories will fade. The first one, which we all know about, is the typical functional memory. You forget names of things. You don't know what how to uh, derive from one place to another. But you still remember in your second type of memory, procedural, how to drive. That leads to conflicts because when it comes time to take away the keys from the elders, they're on different planets talking about memory. The children are talking about, you don't remember where to drive. The senior is talking about, but I still know how to drive. So those two memories will disappear in most of us in time. But the third one, the largest one that you see here on the right, which is the emotional memory, never fades. It stays with you until your grave. And because it's so enduring, we are able to build a solution for communication from elders to the caregivers strictly based on their emotions. We call this uh, approach the assistive self. It uses adaptive artificial intelligence to give those seniors a voice. So if your mother is telling you, get me the thing in the next room on the top of the table, 
our device translates that into bring me my glasses. So what? Nice to care for mom, but how do we build an economy? For, uh, how do we build from this an economy in Puerto Rico? We can create solutions to make it easier to caring for seniors, but our goal is to go beyond this and use this technology to engender a solution in Puerto Rico that creates many jobs. And our approach is this. Uh, we start off by creating a radio show that acts as a magnet. The radio show is animated by the artificial intelligence pet that I just described to you that makes it possible for the seniors to participate. And that radio show will attract age tech startups that want to sell their solutions to an increasingly aging world. And because we have our artificial intelligence that is capable of making everybody understood and, and being participants, we're able to create an audience for these start tech startups. Now, the key to doing this is to have um, a mechanism that is enticing. And so what we do is we create an, a show that is called Granny Talk based on humor. We start off by taking a problem that a senior may have in common. Like for example, in a family, you might find that an elder leaves the stove on and as a result of that may potentially burn down the kitchen. And we turn that into a joke. And by doing that, we're able to then introduce <clears throat> in a serious manner, a high tech solution startup that shows the audience how they would respond. If any of you have ever listened in the United States to an old show that was called Car Talk, which was two physicists from Boston that decided to put a show going on every Saturday. Jose, Jose, Jose we have about five minutes. So just, just time it so we don't overrun uh, because this is really interesting, but we have five minutes. So yes, we're coming to you know, the end. And then we also have Jennifer is here now. So she's, she's standing by as well. Very good. So as a result of that, and here we come to the last slide, um, once you create a solution that can attract an ecosystem of startups, you're now able from Puerto Rico to lead an economy of high tech solutions for elder care. The reality of aging is an inconvenient truth that can be solved. And so with that, I'd like to end this presentation and tell you that seniors have a story to tell and we can give them a voice. And if there's still time, maybe I can answer some questions. Anyone have any questions out there? If not, I just turn it back over to you, Juan. Yeah, what is the expected availability? And then we go to Jennifer. I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, ex but that's okay, we'll leave it for the end. I think we need to, to hear from, from Jennifer and that will be okay. We're good. Jennifer, are you there? I am. Uh, can, can you see me? Can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, but we cannot see you. Okay. Let's see. How about now? Can, can you see me now? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, yes. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, should I just start? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Herrera, and today I'm going to speak about uh, building resiliency. All right, so here it goes. So death is a fascinating topic. So the number of deaths after Hurricane Maria was a supposed 3,057. 4,000, or how can you really tell? I don't know the exact number, but what I do know is the experience of staring death in the face, day after day, community after community, and municipality after municipality, even being held at gunpoint by four men in Lirios del Sur in Ponce, my family's hometown, because the local kingpin thought that Homeland Security and I were raiding their public housing versus trying to feed and save lives. And even with that, having the willingness to find the strength within myself 
to lead and support and feed my Puerto Rican people. Whether it was through a warm meal I was able to serve with my hands or by embracing the sick, sick and elderly with a hug, kiss, and a Dios te bendiga. My experience working on the field for 70 consecutive days with World Central Kitchen, along with Homeland Security, and being the lead chef to have supported Puerto Rico in sourcing and activating 22 satellite kitchens and spearheading my team of volunteer community leaders throughout the municipalities of Puerto Rico in the execution of cooking and serving a minimum of 150,000 meals a day made me realize my own state of existence on this planet and most immediately my own existence in the island of my grandparents, Puerto Rico. Most of all, it has made me realize the social responsibility that each and everyone has in building resilience within ourselves, our families and our communities. This is especially true now when we all are experiencing a global pandemic that is so prevalent and debilitating, plus stronger, more frequent and more devastating natural disasters. I seek to inspire others in using their own life experience in relation to any traumatic experience as such, as a source of being their own teacher, their own learning lesson, and their own source of experience and nourishment to support them with having the willingness to build the pliability to move forward and live another day. Not only live, but thrive. There are many supportive and powerful transformative communities like Star Tides that give you the tools and education that you need in order to build the resiliency within yourself and your, your communities. I seek to support others in building resilience by leading by example and with my own efforts of building resiliency within myself and using techniques of building flexibility and helping me return to pre-crisis status quickly, I've established daily habits and new routines which have created a stronger infrastructure in my life and created much comfort and support. Examples such as self-care and making more time to properly nourish and fuel oneself with balance of the balanced diet, meditation, exercise, yoga, and getting sufficient sleep, caring for oneself and having fun with life will help with staying balanced and better deal with stressful times. And keeping things in perspective and maintaining a hopeful outlook by keeping a broader context and a long-term perspective can help with seeing there is a brighter future beyond the current situation and that the future can be good, not good, but only, but even extraordinary. Thank you very much. Roy Linton, um, I think we, we are at 2.30. Uh, uh, do we have a couple of minutes for questions or <clears throat> we, Ron, you have Ron, to move on? Brilliantly done and putting the panel together. And uh, uh, the answer is uh, for those of you who have to leave us, uh, we will uh, we'll miss you. Uh, but I think we can leave the, uh, the room open for about another, uh, uh, let's say until uh, 40 uh, for- um, Okay. Uh, Okay, and then we have to shut it down to get the next panel going. Okay, thank you for, for that. Um, any questions? Uh, uh, any question, Humberto? Uh, Colorado? Uh, well, le well, let me just um, kind of wrap up then uh, what the- He's better as a question. He, uh, he had a question in chat. Okay, go, go ahead. The question yeah, can is... You, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. My question is, Jose, what does it take in terms of cost and in terms of infrastructure that's needed to support the solution you're proposing? Our solution is free. It's given out um, to elder citizens freely. We're doing it in nursing homes in North Carolina next year. 423 nursing homes will be receiving this because the federal government wants to take them out of the nursing homes and send them home. We make our money in the radio station when the uh, the the startup vendors make their pitches and 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 announce themselves to um, to the audience. I also didn't tell you, but I will. Those startups that make the pitches on our radio station, if they can demonstrate traction, meaning they can demonstrate that they can sell their products, we act as a venture capitalist and we inject funds into their solutions. What's your name? Jose Ramos. 
Could you send me your contact information, please, Jose? Sure. Is that David who's asking? Yes. Yes, sir. D David, do I? I don't know if I have your email address. I can look it up perhaps on the invite and, and send you uh, the information. I would appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, you can also correspond with Juan, who was the panel coordinator. So he has all of the contact information for all of the panelists. Yes, I would like to. I would like to get in touch with all of the panelists. Thank you, and I look for a master, uh, a host list from the organizers and administrators of the Hoova. Okay, Lynn. Um, go ahead. It does. Is there is there a list of of exhibitors and? Um, let's, let's talk about this offline and uh, uh, go back to Juan to, to run the panel. We can, I can talk about this offline, okay? Great, thank you. So <clears throat> what what I wanted to, to do today because is basically to, to show that there are a lot of innovative ideas and a lot of innovative people uh, that could uh, provide uh, solutions or you know prototype for solution that will apply in Puerto Rico as well as the world. I think the, uh, the, the we have the, the talent and what I would like to do is for everybody to follow up with with the speakers or with me and tell us some of the issues that you would like to, to address and solve and because we have access uh, through me, through Parallel 18, through Linton, and, and many other people, we can bring some innovators, innovator people who could address some of those challenges. And if we, if we need to move forward, particularly in the area of artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence just moved from being a cutesy type of, of technology, and just like sensors, what is really becoming the, the challenge is how you're going to use it, what kind of applications you're going to use. And what Jose presented was just one, actually Luca presented another one uh, that is, is interesting. That that's two, those are two that could be used in, in Puerto Rico almost immediately. And, la, and like that, there's another one that is uh, 3D that won the uh, Tibbetts Award, which is the highest award for SBIR. And in Puerto Rico, we, we have the tools to do the trust to commercialize and go some uh, seed funding from federal government uh, through um, SBIR. So we welcome any, uh, any innovation, any ideas, and then uh, we can just put them in contact with some of the faculty members and some even investors just to see how innovative this idea is. And then we can talk about how can we give you the equity, uh, equity free funding from the federal government. And we don't write a proposal for you, but we can actually work with you in, in that. And so I welcome, or we welcome any, any ideas. And, and, with, and with that, if there's any, come, oh, go ahead. Yeah, let me just say that, uh, you know, I, when I try to put a lot of things together with several groups, uh, but I think it's important that Puerto Rico, maybe we have a path to the future. future. What should we do? And there are many areas, obviously, uh, resiliency, uh, technology, uh, smart city or smart island, uh, many of the things that we have discussed, artificial intelligence, all, all of those things are, are very important. And, and you know, uh, maybe with the Science Trust and maybe with other groups and Juan, you and, uh, and Gilberto uh, and Lynn, we can, we can work, take some areas and then say, okay, this is where we should go. This is what we should do to be number one. Not, not, not to do well, to be number one. Because we have the capacity to do it. We have the people, we have the engineer, we have the technical people and then we can get people from other places also. But then get that, you know, let's talk about education and then we get a group for education. Let's talk about health. Let's, let's talk about security, but let's talk about, you know, 
be having in Puerto Rico create a smart island, number one, so that we can teach the world, you know, bring people from all, from all over the world. But at the same time, now that it's so easy to get a group like this together, no matter where you are, get people from all over the world and then discuss these issues, continue to discuss it in a, in a form that we can reach some agreement on what Puerto Rico should do, not as a political party, but as a group of Puerto Ricans from every party that wants the best for Puerto Rico. And then we can assure that all of the candidates from different parties you know, take as their own our proposal. I'd like to uh, support, echo the sentiments of Don Antonio here, because I think I agree with him. Uh, and I think that the challenge for Puerto Rico is to build a separate spider web. You know, a spider uses a web to catch uh, insects to feed itself, but the spider web in Puerto Rico is badly damaged. We can't throw it away, but what we have to do is, while it continues to be used as ineffective as it is, we have to start building a separate spider web. And that's a challenge to do because culturally people will reject the new spider web because they still see the old. We have to figure out how to get around our own cultural impediment to move forward. Uh, I love that idea, Mr. Colorado and, and Jose and Gilberto has been very quiet, but I'm gonna rope him in because you know he knows and I would like to to Gilberto to join us in, in this concept of the spider web. And I, you know, remember my band is to, to have technologies and we can have another spider web for you know, how we can do policy, but uh, particularly in, in disaster relief and what anything, but uh, I would like to, uh, Mr. Colorado, um, I'm trying to not to call you Tito because Gilberto calls, talks about you frequently in a very nice way and always mentions Tito. Everybody so, calls me Tito, so everybody should call me Tito. You know, I, I said, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I went into the Department of State and they asked me, should we call you Congressman or should we call you Honorable? And I said, no, you can call me Tito because everybody else calls me Tito, so no problems. <laughs> so uh, this is fantastic, so I would like to to uh, work with uh, with Alberto and create this group and all the people that were in this committee to to join. So Alberto doesn't know this, but he he and Tito are going to lead this. I'm just going to sit down on the technology side. Linton, thank you for the ten minutes. You're welcome, uh, Juan. Thank you all, everyone on the panel, everyone who uh, attended, and we look forward to uh, uh, many uh, great things for Puerto Rico going forward. Uh, thank, thank, you. thank you. Okay, bye. Bye.